Thank you, America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're back again one more time, B.I.A. Kelsey Live. And uh, this week it's uh, me and Abed. We are all alone. The rest of the team is either stuck in traffic or uh, in client meetings today. So uh, we're going to have a conversation about this week's news in local media and marketing. Uh, also, I want to say we hope you can hear us. Uh, because we're not sure with the new uh, speaker interface whether we're actually broadcasting everything that we're recording. Uh, please let me know if you're seeing a problem. Uh, so, Abed, this week was uh, not dull in the local media space. <laughs> and, and, of course, Roger Waters is touring in 2017, which makes all of life better now. There you go. So, look, let's, uh, let's do the news uh, summary here, and I want to start off, and it's a little related to big tours and celebrity. That is, uh, Google bought FameBit, which is essentially uh, an influencer brokering business uh, this week. They paid an undisclosed amount, uh, and essentially, FameBit uh, brings social media and YouTube stars uh, to brands and figures out how to do uh, product placement, product endorsements, and so forth in order to compensate the influencer and get the brand more exposure. So the question I have, uh, Abed, these kinds of deals are not uncommon. Uh, Google has, uh, or excuse me, Twitter purchased a, a company called Niche, which was similar a few years ago, last year. And uh, certainly there have been many of these influencer marketing or brokering services that have come and gone, many of them into organizations seeking to sort of get a monopoly on those talents. Does that work? Where, how, does, how do we have to think about the relationship of independent influencers to brands, and is this the kind of solution that is going to drive us toward a more efficient approach to that business? Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, so uh, in terms of the, the appropriate size for one of these influencers, the market size, that is, uh, these are not deals where you're trying to necessarily reach 40 or 50 million people. That's Beyonce kind of territory. We're talking about something where maybe a locally prominent person, influential on a particular topic, is also of interest to these brands. So what's the biggest, well, no, let me put it this way. What's the average size audience that we should be thinking about targeting with a, a, a an influencer like that does it have to be a, a small group that they who knows the influencer uh, does it can it be a bigger group and you help build the influencer and if that's the case are you also building brand equity in doing so mm-hmm Right. 
roughly the same size as a, 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 a broadcast, cable broadcast reality show in a lot of ways. So there's an, an right, right. Right, and so you know the other thing that suggests is we're moving into a world that sounds a lot to me like what radio used to be like, which is it was all trade. Do some of these uh, uh, influencers essentially hope to live off of the things they're given to endorse in the future? Is that part of the new economics of this? Mm-hmm. I wonder, though, whether she paid for her car. Right? I don't know. I, it's just interesting to think about the compensation models. Then we can start to judge whether or not people are really saying what they believe or simply pay, saying what they were paid to say, too. And, I, and that's the problem with influence, is it has to remain trustworthy. And so when you sign up with something like YouTube and become an exclusive YouTube personality, does that, in some sense, start to limit your credibility, too? There, there is a, a real scalability of influence issue that we're, we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, in fact, he he uh, he announced a thirty-five dollar, essentially gold Trump card the other day, uh, and people are getting the Trump card. That's the incentive. Uh, yeah, uh, I wonder whether that kind of influence is scalable, but that's another conversation for another podcast too. So let's move on to the next story of the week, and that is Amazon's Project Como, uh, which is essentially a brick-and-mortar strategy to put small Amazon pickup and shopping points potentially all over the place. Uh, the, the service is an extension of what uh, uh, they've been doing with Amazon Fresh, which is delivering uh, home services, uh, home uh, grocery services for about a year and a half now. And uh, they want to literally be able to allow people to walk in and pick up fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh meat, probably locally sourced. I would imagine they're going for higher margin type items in the store. And I would bet you that these roughly Trader Joe sized curated environments will be filled with impulse purchase items. And so you drop off, you drop by, you might have made an order for soap and, and uh, uh, laundry uh, detergent and uh, dried goods and so forth, but you want to get a nice steak for tonight. And by golly, there's the new book from Amazon too. This is a really interesting situation that suggests to me they're adopting Starbucks strategy to be on a right turn within a half mile of any place that people congregate. And so what do you think about this? First off, is it viable? And second, uh, how, does, uh, how does Walmart react to this? We'll get to that later, I, su I suppose. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. you're a you're a fresh customer, right? Okay, so uh, they cut the cost. They dropped. I think it was a two hundred ninety nine dollar. Uh, I made it a fifteen dollar monthly fee, which I imagine in another year will be part of Prime. So, what's it like, and and when you get a a, a delivery, and is it the kind of of experience that is going to drive my expectation? I'd also like to go shop physically with them. Right. So they're paying for convenience, and they're paying for um, uh, greater choice uh, of certain types of products. So, and and going back to the, the data science aspects of this, they already know the buying patterns down to the individual block within a city, whereas Walmart still is trying to understand who's in its stores in many cases. So this allows Starbucks to do the kinds of small location uh planning and uh, site selection that allows them to just pick off certain key areas of business that Walmart might be contending for too. And this consolidates the dash buttons, a number of other of in-home kinds of services that they've been putting, uh, uh, attempting to put into our lives. Uh, this could, you know, Alexa, pick up this uh, and have it be delivered or have it be at the store when you go by. Get me the best steak in the store. Uh, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, and, and again, I think Starbucks is the model to think about. Uh, inexpensive locations at first. Now they really invest in the locations. But in a, they'll be Trader Joe's, which are in strip malls, which are using retail space abandoned because Amazon's there in the first place. I think that the, that and with SaaS services, uh, software, I, I, and in fact, the next story I'm going to suggest it should be thought of as a web of services. Uh, 
Uh, well, in fact, we can even start the segue now, can't we? Uh, <laughs> wow, we did that so naturally, and I just messed it up by pointing it out. Look, folks, break the fourth wall. Uh, so, but but we are. We're talking about an environment where um, services augment these physical uh, uh, experiences uh, that, in some cases, have been virtualized in, you know, the box on your front door from Amazon until now. But now Amazon is stepping up to a higher level of engagement. I would imagine just, and, and the reason I call out Trader Joe's is the example I would point to, is Trader Joe's has people who are there who know the food, who can make recommendations. They are influencers in the store. And I think that's where uh, watching how Amazon has been studying, amongst others, Trader Joe, uh, that those stores are not going to be 7-Eleven-like. Those stores are going to be uh, Apple Store-like. Yeah. Well, so then the, this web of services that's going to start to uh, encompass individuals, and I think those individuals are going to be consumers. They might be workers who are uh, aligned with a company because they get a bunch of, of, of on-demand services as part of their, uh, their work experience, uh, is represented by something that Lyft did this week. So they struck a deal with um, uh, Brookdale Senior Living, which is a senior living home developer, uh, and essentially, through this system, anybody who lives in a Brookdale facility will be able to use a Lyft uh, ride to go to the doctor, go to the store, many of the things that had previously been uh, delivered through a scheduled bus service. And so they're going to lower their costs by getting rid of the buses, or at least using them less, and offload that uh, logistical challenge to Lyft. Is this representative of the kinds of alliances that brands need to start thinking about putting together as a lifestyle solution for somebody in a particular geography? You know, where Lyft and Brookdale now are starting to try to define ease of living for seniors. Are we going to see other brands combining to create lifestyle offerings, which are an amalgam of branded experiences targeted at particular groups of people? Right. Mm -hmm. Ah. Right. Or a promotional offer, yeah. Right. Right. Mm hmm Mm hmm Right. Well, and, and so uh, something you just said really catalyzed for me the idea that this will also be offered to people, for instance, as on-demand workers. So if I work for Lyft as an on-demander, I'll get a Lyft discount. I may be able to tap into my own Lyft concierge service in the future, but also get discounts at movie theaters and other things that are local because Lyft struck those deals. And right, and so instead of thinking of, 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 of employee benefits as just health care and, and unemployment coverage and, and, and uh, all of that, you should be thinking of it now as maybe a broader range of, of services. A lot like when I worked for Microsoft, we had a mall on campus where we had discounts and I can get discounts at any store in the region uh, because they've struck those deals. Uh, interestingly, very few people use those because it was difficult to use and we're getting to a point where now it'll be seamless, where the uh, the offers will simply walk in based on my phone's identity and be transferable to the, the merchant who is going to provide a service. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. And retention is really the thing, not only for customers, but for the providers of the services as well. So we can see some convergence of, of different uh, motivations for the same exper lifestyle experience these brands are offering. Huh. Okay. Well, you know, that's the end of the news for this week. Abed, thanks. Uh, you know, we, uh, we survived the traffic and got here in time, but the rest we will punish. I, I know. I know. So uh, next week, folks, we're going to be back. Uh, we have a guest. Uh, uh, we're going to be talking with Yellcast, which is uh, doing a very interesting intent casting uh, launch in Santa Fe. So we're uh, looking forward to that conversation next week, and uh, do join us. Uh, and in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to send me uh, a mail. My email address is mratcliffe at biakelsey.com. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions or talk about being on the air with us, uh, please let us know. Thanks, folks. This is BIA Kelsey Live. That's Abit Chaudhry. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we'll be back next week.